sourcing paradigm, which is basically when us as requesters have, you know, you want to gather input that requires minimal amount of human intelligence or uh, to, and extends over to more complex tasks, and you want to basically recruit this human intelligence on demand. This is what you uh, can turn to. And these are platforms where you can uh, recruit workers who are all around the world and are willing to contribute in returns for small amounts of uh, monetary compensation. So uh, the perspective that we're presenting is to treat these workers as learners. But why is that all that new? Because uh, this is mainly because of the fact that this whole crowdsourcing paradigm isn't a very typical learning environment. It's not typical because of the fact that there is absolutely no information regarding the background or the knowledge of the worker or his skills. Uh, it's not basically a necessity in these platforms. And the other fact is that the crowdsourced microtasks are by default very short in nature. And workers face an on-the-fly like situation where they have to learn and exhibit their learning immediately. This can be similar to micro-learning or experiential learning, but it's not quite the same because of the fact that, uh, like I said, workers have to adapt very quickly, learn things quickly, and uh, implement their learning immediately. And it might so happen that something they pick up and learn through the course of task completion is something they'll never use again, right? So that makes it a pretty novel and interesting uh, environment to look into in terms of learning. Uh, to give you a better description of what the landscape of crowdsourcing microtasks look like, I'll refer to some of our previous work where we discussed the uh, taxonomy of microtasks on the web. Some of the tasks that are popularly crowdsourced uh, belong to categories such as content access, where workers are merely asked to uh, access con some content and consume it. We have surveys, content creation tasks, where workers might be asked to write reviews or generate annotations interpret and analyze uh, images and so forth. You have verification and validation tasks, and you also have information finding tasks. Uh, very recently, about a couple of years ago, Jalel and others uh, came up with a very nice analysis of how the dynamics of this marketplace, Amazon Mechanical Turk in particular, uh, have varied and evolved over the years. So they had a pretty large data set of all the tasks that were crowdsourced on Amazon Mechanical Turk over a period of five years. And using this taxonomy, they uh, came up with an evolutionary analysis of how things have changed over the years. And one of the findings was that information finding tasks were prominent across these years and were also uh, seen to increase in uh, volume. So that's the uh, sort of task that we're interested in. Information finding tasks are basically uh, simple tasks where workers are required to search on the web to find a piece of information, retrieve it, and uh, either paste it into the uh, open text field that's available or provided in whatever form that's requested. Uh, now, at this point, I'd like to talk to you a tiny bit about how task consumption is uh, in crowdsourcing marketplaces. So it's a very self-selection based way in which tasks are consumed. So I, me as a worker, I can go onto a site and if I sign up, I can get access to a bunch of tasks that are available uh, and choose and pick and choose what I want to work on. The result of this, though, is that uh, the task consumption looks a bit like this. It's a power law, which indicates that a lot of, uh, very few workers complete all the tasks that are available in a batch. So an interesting thing to note here is that there are a few requesters that deploy identical tasks, and they do so in a very large batch. So imagine uh, annotating images, and you have this uh, gigantic set of 100 images or whatever, or thousands. And uh, as a worker who's completing these tasks, I have the opportunity to complete all the tasks that are available in the batch. But as you can imagine, that might be something that's very monotonous and boring and fatigue and other aspects uh, can you know, encourage people to just drop out of that. And that's pretty much what we observe. And most workers drop out after completing only a few tasks in a long batch. But what is the effect of these uh, dropouts? Prior research has shown that when workers squander an opportunity to learn through the course of a batch, they also potentially lose out on this opportunity to learn through the course of the batch. Because as they keep completing more tasks, they get a better grip on how to complete tasks and how exactly to do so in an effective and efficient manner in terms of how much time is required to complete the task or what's the easiest way to search for something and so forth. So how can we solve this problem? And uh, the perspective we present in this work is to try and improve worker retention. So we argue that if you try and 
you know, retain workers in these long, repetitive batches of tasks, you give them this additional potential to actually learn and get better through the course of it. And uh, what we're interested in doing is to also understand how such retention could actually have an effect on uh, the worker performance and if there's any learning that occurs through the course of retention and batches. And we'd also like to measure this learning. In this context, I'd like to uh, take you on a little segue to achievement motivation. Achievement motivation is the need for success or the attainment of excellence. And individuals will satisfy their needs through a lot of different means and are driven to succeed for various reasons. These could be both internal or external. And uh, achievement motivation is something that's been very widely studied in psychology. And there are very diff uh, many different understandings that have been uh, brought to the front. Uh, one of the noteworthy ones, and something that we've also relied upon in this uh, piece of work, is was introduced by Hart and al in 2009. And the authors basically proposed uh, a way of looking at achievement motivation. They said that the goal to succeed and achieve can be looked upon as an alternative to the goal to have fun and indulge in leisurely activities. So what they essentially meant was that you could look at individuals as either having a choice to, uh, to choose to succeed and achieve at the expense of having fun. And these would be people who basically take pleasure in succeeding. And that would, form, uh, that would imply that these people have a high achievement motivation. Pro athletes like Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps, or the President of the United States, Francis Underwood, would be good examples. <laughs> On the other hand, you also have people who are not, are not necessarily overwhelmed by uh, the opportunity to succeed, and they'd rather just have fun. And these people would uh, fall into the group of those who have low achievement motivation. And one good example here would be the English football team. They like to have more fun than win, right? Uh, what exactly happens, though? Now we understand that achievement motivation can be looked uh, you can look at achievement motivation in people and treat them differently. But how do these people, how do people in general react to achievement triggers? So when you have achievement related tri uh, triggers, or you can call them cues or primes, they're basically motivational triggers. Uh, these two different groups of people react differently to that. Uh, the chronically high achievement motivated group exhibit a goal seeking behavior when they encounter such primes, such achievement related or motivation related primes. On the other hand, the low achievement motivated group would elicit a fun seeking behavior or would exhibit fun seeking goals, right? That's the basic difference. And in the past, uh, what researchers have done to use uh, primes or motivational triggers is they used words that indicate a sense of achievement, such as win, master, or excel, achieve, and so forth. So that's a little bit of a background story on what we're going to build on. So what are our research questions? Uh, one of the things we're interested in answering is how can achievement priming be used to increase the worker retention and facilitate learning and information finding microtasks? And how is the learning process of workers affected by this whole thing? Well, the only way to answer it is to go ahead and conduct some experiments. That's exactly what we did. At this point, we didn't uh, want to go ahead and use uh, achievement words as primes alone, because we figured that uh, because of the repetitive nature of crowdsourced tasks, we might need something that's stronger. And we posited the usage of inspirational quotes as achievement primes. And to do so, what we did was we turned to Brainy Quote, our one major source of inspiring quotes, and uh, crawled a bunch of uh, quotes that had to do with achievement or inspiration. And to make sure we actually find or narrow down a set of quotes that can be generalizably claim to be inspiring, we crowdsourced this whole thing. We asked a number of workers to rate different quotes on a scale in terms of how inspiring they found the quote to be, and arrived at a bunch of quotes that we found were most inspiring. Uh, and the tasks that we uh, manually created were meant to reflect the real world information finding microtasks, which means they were meant to create, uh, meant to reflect the workflow that actually happens. Which means a worker is given a particular piece of information to look for, he goes onto the web, searches for it, and comes back and find, uh, reports what he's found. So the task we assume is that of finding middle names of personalities, but we're also cognizant of the fact that real world crowdsourcing microtasks have 
a varying amount of task difficulty, right? So some tasks are easier, some others are much harder. And to reflect this, we also try to come up with an objective means of modeling this task difficulty, and we try to do so with a very simple heuristic. So uh, this one is, uh, says, find the middle name of Daniel Craig. If someone Googles this, you'll find that there's one unambiguous person called Daniel Craig who has a uh, whatever middle name, right? And then we came up with some others where there are multiple people who are called George Lucas. Of course, it's not the one you, you're all thinking about. It's an archbishop. And uh, here, there's this additional step of disambiguation that's required, adding a layer of difficulty. And in the final case, it's similar again. We have a Brian Smith, except that now there are plenty of Brian Smiths. And uh, we also have plenty of uh, Brian Smiths who play ice hockey. And now we give this third layer of disambiguation that's required, and people have to go through another layer of uh, you know, resolving multiple identities before they can come back with the right middle name. That was about the tasks. Now about the primes themselves. So how are we motivating these people? There are two different ways to do this, and we try to explore both of them. One of them is called passive achievement priming, and the other one is called active achievement priming. The difference here is in the level of interaction that a user has with the primes themselves. So in active pr achievement priming, a user or a learner has to interact directly with the prime. What this means is uh, clearly showcased in the first example. So if you notice the first one's the finding the middle name task, while the second one's finding the author of the following quote. So by modeling this prime as it, within the same workflow that the actual task has, the user is not necessarily aware of what's happening, right? He's just completing information finding tasks, and following exactly the same workflow, instead of finding the middle name, he's fi here he's uh, supposed to find the author. And uh, that's active achievement priming, because he's directly acting, interacting with the uh, prime. In the second case, you basically intersperse these quotes without requiring the user to actually directly interact with it. And uh, so, you know, we, perhaps the user would read it, perhaps he doesn't, we're not enforcing this interaction. What, uh, how does the rest of the experimental setup look? So we explored, uh, like I mentioned, a condition. We also had a control group where uh, workers did not receive any sort of uh, primes in between. We had the active achievement priming, the passive achievement priming. But to make sure that this effect that we might observe is not purely because of an, uh, an intervention, and uh, to actually see whether or not the nature of the quotes have an effect, we also considered using random quotes in two different settings. Uh, so we had 10 different batches of information finding tasks with 12 tasks each. So there were a total of 120 tasks. And all workers were allowed to go on as long as they wanted to. And they were free to drop out whenever they did. And on average, we had around 91 trustworthy workers in each condition. And all the tasks within the batches were randomized. We also had the primes uh, randomized within the batches of tasks. And all the workers were compensated according to the minimum wage, which is uh, 7.5 US dollars at uh, the hourly rate. And we also considered three levels of task difficulty, like I mentioned, and these were evenly distributed. So we had 40 tasks each of uh, the three different dis difficulty levels. Uh, now what we tried to do was come up with a simple way to measure learning rate. And to do so, we came up with two components to this. And the first component is basically telling us how much a uh, the accuracy of a worker is changing from one batch to another as he proceeds uh, towards the completion of tasks. And the second component is, uh, describes the overall average accuracy of uh, the worker. It's a very simple notion, but tries to uh, capture a sensible means of measuring learning. And we call this the learning rate of the worker. So I'll dive straight into the findings. One of the most important and key findings is uh, in terms of the worker retention rate. What we observe here uh, is that active achievement priming, where uh, the workers directly have to deal with the primes and interact with the primes, has a considerably significant, a significant impact on retention itself. So the blue triangles that you see, the line, the, the line on top, depicts that of the uh, active achievement priming. The y-axis tells you the percentage of workers who are dropping out at each stage, and the x-axis just shows you uh, the different tasks within each batch. And uh, we basically found that active achievement priming has a pretty significant impact on retention. But do inspirational quotes really matter? And 
apparently they do because we found out that random quotes, in fact, had a negative Im impact on retention, uh, but probably because this deviated uh, the workers from what they were doing or uh, we, we can get into this later, but we, we sort of have an understanding of why this is happening and it, it's more because uh, these quotes act as a hindrance instead of supporting or facilitating further activity from the workers. Uh, what's interesting to see is, again, like I mentioned, the active achievement priming has a significant impact on the worker retention rate. But this also comes at a cost because of the fact that uh, picture you had you know, 100 or 120 tasks in your batch. Now what you're essentially doing is you're making it 145 because you're inserting these primes. So all this comes at a cost. But when, you, uh, when we sort of split out these tasks, we do notice that there's a, uh, the workers get more effective in terms of how much time they take to complete each of the tasks. But the net value is, of course, uh, a trade-off that you have to deal with in terms of task completion time. Uh, this is how the accuracy of workers looked across the batches as they proceed from one, to, from one batch to another. I'll quickly tell you what short, medium, and long uh, represent. We grouped, just to interpret our findings better and analyze them in a presentable fashion, we grouped workers into short, medium, and long uh, groups to represent how many tasks they completed. So the short group represents those who completed 25% of the tasks, medium, between 25 to 75 and long represents those who completed more than 75% of the tasks. And I'll take you straight to the talking point in this particular slide that uh, basically shows us that by using either active or passive priming, there's, there's less of an ebb and flow in terms of how the accuracy uh, proceeds as you pro prolong in the uh, batch of tasks. And we also note that the accuracy stabilizes in the best case. So if you look at the uh, box plots and the la in the condition where we have the most observable effect in worker retention, we notice that the accuracy of workers in the long group stabilizes consi considerably, although there's no significant difference in the accuracy across the di uh, different conditions. What about the worker learning rate? So the worker learning rate, if I, if I can take you back to what it is a function of, is a function of the difference in the accuracy of workers between batches as they pro proceed from one batch to another, as well as their, their overall average accuracy across the batches. And uh, let me explain this with this table here. So if you look at each one of the columns, you'd, you're looking at the priming condition, and what you observe is that in the short batch, which is the first set of tasks workers are working on, they obviously have no idea what's happening, so they learn more. There's more scope to learn within the initial short set of batches. So from batch one to two, you can learn more. From two to three, you can learn more because that's new and there's just more room to learn. And this decreases as you uh, proceed from short to medium and long. What we do observe, however, is that the most amount of uh, learning or the change in learning rate is high in the initial uh, short group for the active priming condition. And now we also looked into the effect of task difficulty. Intuitively, you'd imagine that people uh, perform with lowering accuracy as the difficulty level goes up. It's something we also found here. Consistent, not a eureka moment. And uh, what we were more interested in, though, is to find if there was an effect on task difficulty, uh, of task difficulty on the retention rate. And we found that there was no significant effect of uh, task difficulty on the worker retention rates. Two big conclusions that we can draw from this are that uh, achievement priming does improve uh, the worker retention rate as well as the learning rate. And inspirational quotes can act as good achievement primes and we found that in our best case, this uh, bumps up the worker retention uh, to 8%, over 8%. And before I leave you with that, just one more thing. Let me leave you with a nice positive quote. <laughs> I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeeded. Michael Jordan. Thank you, everybody. Yes. So there's a lot of results. And yes. I want to go back to um, a, a few more slides. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one. So for, um, we find that for the applicable folks, um, 
it has a strong effect for the active. But it actually, it's the opposite for the inverse. Wouldn't we expect that um, irrelevant quotes that are active to actually have a stronger effect against retention? You know what I mean? Because it goes 28-32 mm -hmm. for a passive active. Yeah. Intuitively, if I'm understanding this correctly, I would actually expect that to be inverse. I would expect the passive um, to have a... Uh, All right. So, uh, very good question, and uh, this can actually be explained by some of the prior work in worker retention in crowdsourcing microtasks. So, what you can look at this whole thing in a different way is simply as a, as a micro intervention. So, there's this been there's been work in the past about micro interventions and how to overcome fatigue or boredom in repetitive tasks. And what prior work has showcased is that no matter what the intervention is, it's going to help to an extent, depending on how painful the intervention itself is. So we believe that uh, while passive random quotes can be something you know, that workers can ignore easily, they probably, uh, you know, it, uh, the active random quote acts as a better micro-intervention because they actually deviate from this continuous monotonous uh, activity of finding middle names. So that's how we sort of can explain it, but uh, I don't know if that is the right answer. But it's a very good, very good question. Can I follow up with another question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, did you track the browser events and to see if they were copy pasting or if they were actually reciting them from, from memory? We did, and uh, we found that a lot of them were copy pasting it, but we didn't. So we, we were actually looking into the uh, user low level behavioral traces as a part of another study that we're doing simultaneously. But uh, just to answer your question, yes, a lot of them copy-paste the middle names. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, when you're uh, finding the, the quotes to use, did you, uh, did you uh, pull the same population that you later used for the study? No, it was a completely different population. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, I guess I'm, I've inspired you all now. Let's go. I think we all want more time with your, with your slides. I think to yeah. your questions, right. but uh, very, very interesting. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Yeah. Thank you.